It is my privilege this morning to introduce our next speaker for the 9 o'clock hour, uh, Brother Nathan Fritz. I specifically asked to get to introduce him because we uh, actually were classmates at Florida College 25 years ago. Uh, I want to remind Nate that uh, people who went to FC with me cannot speak to my current students about how I acted when I was at FC 25, 26 years ago. Uh, but we are certainly glad to have him with us this morning. He attended Middle Tennessee State University before coming to Florida College and was here at FC in 91 and 92. Uh, taking some upper division Bible classes. In 1992, he went into full-time preaching, first at Edgewood in Lakeland. And then in 1993, he relocated to Lubbock, Texas, to work with the West End Congregation, which moved and became the Milwaukee Avenue Congregation, and he's been there ever since. Uh, so spending 24 years in that one work, uh, obviously it's been a good work. He's been their preacher during that time. For the last nine years, he's also served as a shepherd with that congregation. Uh, his wife, Angie, uh, and he have been married for 28 years. They have uh, three children and a grandchild. Uh, he's also been involved in the work in Bulgaria and in Russia. And coming up at the end of March, he's going to be returning to Bulgaria and Russia to continue that work. I know he would appreciate your prayers very much in that endeavor. We've asked him to speak to us this morning on the topic of love seeks not its own, the problem of elevating emotions over the will. And we look forward to that very much. And so I encourage you to pay attention to the lesson that Brother Nate Fritz is going to bring to us. Good morning. Let's turn our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. As you... Uh, pray for the upcoming trip uh, into Bulgaria and Russia for myself and my my faithful sidekick, Brother Chris Melton. Uh, I hope also that you'll uh, that you'll include uh, uh, Jonathan Longstreth. Uh, uh, if you're keeping up on Facebook, which I don't do very well, I readily admit, uh, but there's been some posts there and uh, some of the serious. Uh, problems that he's been having. I hope that you'll pray for him as well, little guy. I believe it to be providential, uh, or at least I did uh, prior to standing up here this morning, that uh, at uh, this hour, uh, to give a lecture at this hour, I would only have about half of the people that are here to speak to because I know how preachers are and they just don't get up that early most of the time. Uh, but uh, I, and actually, I'm just kidding about that. Uh, I know that uh, those who preach the, the gospel are, are busy and up early and go to bed late and carry class loads that most people don't really understand, to be honest, uh, who are uh, faithful members within a congregation. And I'm grateful to Florida College as well. Uh, just a brief mention there, the faculty, the Bible department, uh, Brother Payne, others uh, who behind the scenes are, are active and working uh, diligently for this, uh, this week that we get to enjoy and be a part of. And uh, I hope that uh, the information that we'll be looking at together this morning in this lesson will, uh, will in some at least small way, help us in our uh, desire to better please God within the home and family. It is a greatly needed topic. And I'm glad that, uh, that we get to deal with it. The fact of the matter is that uh, for uh, many years now, uh, several years now, it is, it is uh, I believe, a, a factual point that uh, we, we who preach and teach the gospel, those of us who are Christians and diligent about being faithful to God's cause, uh, have really gotten behind the eight ball when it comes to home and family. And our society, uh, the direction of our society, clearly shows that to be uh, the case, at least to some degree. And so dealing with it and talking about it is, is something that certainly will not hurt. In fact, it will help those of us who want to serve God in the areas in, in, that we do. I want to begin by reading out of uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. And if you'll just read along with me, either flip over there or tap over there if you're using a, a, a mobile device or something. And we want to take special emphasis on verse 5 of this text. The Bible says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, 
but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. The Bible teaches that one of the, the really predominant characteristics that reveals the force and the nature of love is that it does not seek its own. That is one of those places in the, in the text that if you don't have that underlined, that's an underlinable part of the text. It really defines in a great way what this chapter really is getting through to us. Love does not seek its own. It is not self-seeking. And essentially what that means is that, uh, that really our desire is for others more than it is for our self. Now that goes contrary to our nature, the way that we have been raised, in other words, the way that we have been uh, taught to think about ourselves and to think about others round about us. It does not insist upon its own way, its own rights as if it had rights. Rather, those who genuinely love neither take any thought for themselves, nor do they pursue their own interests. They are unselfishly motivated, is the point. Well, now, if you think about that from this context, that's what this context is all about. A love that is unselfishly motivated. Love does these things, love does not do these things. Because they, these things are not love. This is what love does. It's a comparable text with itself. Their feelings on a matter are more greatly determined by their feelings for others rather than feelings for self when we talk about someone who does not seek their own or a love that does not seek their own. In a culture that is overrun with a sense of entitlement and egotism, where one considers self to be the, the hub of all experience. This is a critical lesson for us to not only think about, but practice, to learn and practice, to make application. Essentially, that is true for husbands and wives. It is true for the family unit, parents and children, in other words, what I mean. It is true even for elders and deacons within the local flock of God's people. We must learn a love that does not seek its own way, does not hamper its own self above anything and everyone else. But you see, this is difficult because it is the society that we've been raised in to think more about self than anyone else, than anything else. One's own personal happiness becomes really the focal point of living. The Bible calls us to serve one another, to bear one another's burdens, to look out for the interests of others. Places like Galatians 5 and, and chapter 6 and in Philippians 2 and so forth. In agreement with these concepts, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, teaches us that we should not seek our own happiness, relying only upon our own feelings as to what will please me or what will displease me. And instead, we should seek the welfare of others as more important than our own. Even when personal sacrifice and self-denial become something that we must implement. Now, doesn't that sound crazy? That I would rather someone else, I would prefer someone else to have their way than for me to have my way. You see, that does go contrary to the way we've been taught in our society. And it's not just our society, it's worldwide. The pursuit of pleasure is really no new thing. Who doesn't want to feel good? Who doesn't want to be happy? Our own nation's Declaration of Independence speaks about this. We are born into a society that says these things. 
life, liberty, the pursuit of what? Happiness. The consideration for one's feelings or happiness, that is really age old. I know that, and, and it's clear, and it will continue to be clear in our discussion throughout the week, that, that really it, it's becoming a great issue of how people view themselves in a self-centered society. One's own self is all that makes any difference. I suppose that we could trace this all the way back to the Garden of Eden, couldn't we? I did this because it's what I wanted. It's what felt right. It's what looked right. Adam and Eve would give in their defense. And for some still today, it's true. Good feelings, we have trained ourselves, many of us in here probably, have trained ourselves to think different than that. To be the people who are sojourners and pilgrims, who, who are not trained by this world, but by what God says about things. The Creator, taking Him into our perspective and thinking about what that means for us. Happiness comes from doing right things, in other words. But we all understand and know that for the majority, now my little thing is red, which means it's not working, is it, is it, doesn't it? I'm sorry, you don't get any charts today. For the vast majority, rather than thinking in terms of, of living righteously or virtuously, many have come to associate happiness instead with the advancement of what is wrong and the suppression of what is right. And Brother Dickey talked about that in our last lecture. The avoidance of pain and the pursuit of pleasurable feelings. And here's a question for you, and this was what I wanted the charts for actually, was this question. And because we have to think about the wording of this together for just a second. Does happiness or feeling good come from a pursuit of it, or does it come as a byproduct of the pursuit of virtuous living? Does happiness or good feelings come from the pursuit of it? Or does it come as a byproduct of the pursuit of virtuous living? It's easy to see from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 1 through 8 that love not only is fundamentally necessary in the fact that it is mentioned here and over 500 other times in Scripture, but love does and does not do certain things. In fact, we can count 15 descriptors in that text that you have there in front of you in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that reveal to us the both positive and the negative nature. Seven are presented in the positive, and I want you to take note of the fact that nine are presented in the negative. What that tells us, ladies and gentlemen, is it is much easier to pervert love than to use it the way God created it for it to be used in our life. We, we run the danger of a perverted love in our life. Notice as well the positive stated there in verse 2 of your text. Many have had great gifts, and yet there were none to be perfectly mature in those gifts. In verses 2 and 3 there of your text, can you imagine owning the complete gift of prophecy, for example? Can you, can you even imagine understanding not some? Can you imagine understanding all mysteries? Can you imagine owning all knowledge? Having all faith? These are extreme statements by the apostle to help us understand these, are, these would be wonderful, out of this world ideas for us. And yet if we did have such limitless gifts and abilities and strengths without love, God, the text is saying, would consider us in all of our godlike eloquence, in all of our powerful words and limitless wisdom and, and unlimited knowledge and understanding as only a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Without love, you see, we are just crass, harsh, annoying noises. 
assemble without the accompaniment of any kind of orchestra. Sounds horrible. The apostle speaks with this extreme judgment in mind as he, as he states these facts when he says that I might have a whole lot of great abilities. I might be God's gift to the brethren. But without love, I am absolutely nothing. Now let me just refresh our minds for a second about what nothing actually is. It is the zero amount of anything. <laughs> it is the altogether absence of something. So that's kind of a great way to think about it. So don't miss the point that the apostle is making. It doesn't matter who we are, ladies and gentlemen. What abilities we might have, where we come from. Paul says not a single good thing can come from you and me, just as it could not come from him, even as an apostle of Jesus Christ, without the presence of love in him first. Now, brethren, that's something for us to really seriously consider. What motivates us to be the way that we are? Who we are? How we act? How we speak? How we function? Love is expected to be in us and come out of us from God. True love produces genuine feelings of goodness. True love, as our text is teaching us, does not promote one's own self and it does not put forth itself, but rather it is the opposite and it holds others in high esteem. It does not seek its own. There may be many in God's kingdom today who feel that they possess all kinds of great skill and insight and knowledge and that their faith is great. And in fact, they may be better than others around them to some degree. That may be even true. But then those same many times turn and they treat God's people with contempt or derision, biting, sometimes even backbiting, devouring one another. They direct their feelings toward the negative things that love, the Apostle Paul is teaching, is not rather than the positive things that he says love actually is. They lack proper love in their pride and their self-seeking ambitions. Having a love which seeks only its own, they will always fail. This type of character will always fail to truly be somebody, listen, maybe not true among people, but to God. Because they're nothing more than a sounding brass, a clanging cymbal. They are nothing, God says. We can't fail is the point in really desiring to have proper love. You might notice as well, as well out of this text, this kind of love is, a, is really a very rare love so that when people examine us, they see something that is very different from that of the world. Remind you of Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Jesus says to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him, and you remember those next words, deny himself. That's what 1 Corinthians 13 is speaking about. Let him deny himself. Take up his cross. Put himself not as first, but as last. And follow me. Every great leader among God's people has first become a follower. And every great leader who is a follower stays a follower of Jesus Christ. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, then we can find it. The obvious point is that we become selfless in our thinking. This verse speaks to the opposite of the statement, love seeks its own. It does not seek its own. In all practical terms, it's talking about the feeling of selfless attitudes, throwing off all things that would hold us to value ourselves more than others. Our society has sought first its feelings. It has become self-seeking. Throwing off moral virtues has become a real point of life for many who make up our nation. 
taking God out of his leadership role and putting oneself in that place has become really the norm. The extreme and the overabundance of that is one who is obsessed with experiencing any kind of good feeling which can be enjoyed regardless of what God says on the matter that doesn't even factor in to a lot of people's minds. And the truth is many people have never really risen above the feeling of selfishness and self-centeredness in their life, though they have become older and sometimes even older within and among God's people. They become conditioned and trained by a love for their own feelings rather than God's feelings on a matter. I went to pick a birthday card for my wife a couple of weeks ago. She turned older. Have you, uh, have you ever noticed as you go to pick out a birthday card or an anniversary card, some card of, of a loving nature like that, that you're trying to express to the person you're going to give this card to of, of, of how, how much you think of them? And you're looking for that right sentiment, right? Let me read you some of them. And these are the actual cards that I picked. Some of these are the actual cards I picked up and, and took note of. To my love... I love you because of what you do for me. You encourage me. You make me feel good about myself. You make me laugh. The bottom, of, the bottom line is this, that you make me incredibly happy. Happy birthday, darling. <laughs> Another one says, to my wife, you are the reason behind my feelings of happiness. You are the reason for my success, and you are the reason for my smile. Another says, you make me, uh, you make all my days beautiful. You make, me, you make my world bloom with joy. You make me feel complete. Now, the truth is, uh, when I read some of these at, at home uh, for a lesson similar to this one, uh, most, most of the people in the congregation, or many of them anyway, uh, except for that first one, that's pretty obvious, but the last two, they, got, they, they really didn't understand, why are you reading this? Well, it sounds fine. I mean, this is the kind of cards that I buy. I tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, here is a, here's a challenge from those of us who love to go pick cards for our loved ones. How about this? How about we start telling someone how much we love them without first telling them how much we, how, how much we love and how much we think and feel about ourselves first? You know, it's actually hard to pick out a card wherever you go, Walmart or CVS or whatever that speaks to that person about what you love about that person without actually first giving a whole detail of why you love yourself and how they fit into that. That is such a small illustration about such a great problem. Our conditioning of care for our own feelings first blinds us to the true path of what love is really all about in home and family. Some are almost completely preoccupied with their selfish feelings. All you got to do is open up Facebook for five seconds and you see it. I'm not against Facebook, but I'm against the idea that what goes out there is just what matters to me, my feelings, my thinking on something, what I would like to just get off my chest. Are we totally self-centered? Seeking our own way. Being driven by how we feel rather than how we love shows up in our home, in our family. In other words, with our children, with our wife. It shows up in local congregations. And seeking one's own shows up in a nation through attitudes which are purely, purely rooted in selfishness and self-centeredness. A couple of illustrations to make that point valid. Since 1973, our nation has allowed, and in many cases, really just praised the right 
to kill more babies each year than the casualties of all of our wars and our nation's existence all put together. I did not say that our nation has killed that many children. I've said each year our nation has killed that many children. Since 1973, 1.06 million in 2015 alone. Ladies and gentlemen, those statistics are staggering. And if nothing else causes us to have fear about a society and to pray for a society and to try to be an effective part for God's purpose in a society about what real love should be and do, it is that statistic. There is no greater statistic than that that should cause and prompt fear in us about what happens when people turn away from God. A woman should have an inherent feeling of love and affection for life that grows within her. But that same woman can perversely feel that that is inhibiting to her own lifestyle, to future plans that she had, and she selfishly takes the option of what the world calls today pro-choice. And that word, that terminology, sure sounds nice. It's a choice. It's pro. I want to ask you a question, ladies and gentlemen. Who exactly does this choice favor? Is it one who is seeking their own? Or is it a child who grows within the mother? You see, this person only seeks their own way in their thinking. It's a perfect example of what the Bible is teaching love does not do. They foolishly have been taught that unleashing one's feelings and desires and, and pleasure are the, are the right of everyone. No one has the right to tell me or to make my life uh, in such a way that I don't get to do what I want, feel the way I want, and think the way I want. And that is true with the exception of God Almighty Himself. He does have the right. And He has spoken. But you see, our society says that really it is the fulfillment of one's des desire that matters most. Some balk at the worship of those false gods we read about in Scripture. We say, how stupid of those people. They were so ignorant did not even understand who the Almighty God was. And they did atrocious things to their homes and their families in the name of these false deities. And I want to say to you, ladies and gentlemen, abortion is truly no different than that. Not really. Babies are being sacrificed every day on the altar of selfishness, the pursuit of one's own feelings. I don't want to be inhibited. That's my feeling. I had these other plans. That's, that's what my feelings are about the matter. And nothing. I don't feel like anything should stand in the way or anyone. And babies are being sacrificed every day on the altar of this. Seeking one's own. Gratifying one's own feelings. Regardless of the cost of it all. I'm going to make a statement that I usually don't do, and that's to give uh, this, you know, you've heard people say, well, uh, you've heard your children say, well, you always, and we say, you can't ever put that kind of structure in your sentence, right? You don't always, right? Maybe most of the time that could be valid. But I would say to you, ladies and gentlemen, without fail, always, always violent actions against others are rooted in caring more about one's own feelings to the neglect and the abuse of others. That happens in the home, and it happens in our nation, and it even happens in our churches. Because we seek our own rather than promoting the others around us. Since we're speaking on the topic of home and family this week, it seems valid as well to introduce this idea or interject this idea. 
We can see how we're living in a time with those who are apparently in power where they really do not have an idea of what we're speaking about today, a love that does not seek its own. In a message that's posted by the White House in June chapter, uh, June, June chapter 15, June 2015, in, in a five, the, 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 the quote is this, in a 5-4 decision, the Supreme Court took a huge step forward in our progress toward a more perfect union. Today, gay and lesbian couples won their right to marry. Today, and you might remember this part of the quote, love wins. You remember that? It's when the White House was put in, uh, you know, lit up in the rainbow colors. Today, love wins. And I suppose, ladies and gentlemen, that on the, the face of it, to a, to a degree, we could say, well, this is a very romantic thought. You know, kind of like Romeo and Juliet, never mind the ending. But you know, two people who have feelings for one another, but they've been kept apart. They've just been torn apart by opposing forces. They get to come together. Happy reunion. Happy relationship. Bliss-filled. The feelings which have been suppressed, now they can be let go and, and things will be better now. Love will be realized where it couldn't be before and had been so suppressed. The LGBTQ community has truly not adequately considered the ramifications of nature itself in places like Romans chapter 1, not to mention just simple scientific understanding, biological understanding. Verse 17, in Romans chapter 1, Paul says the wise will live by faith, not feelings. You might notice he doesn't mention that. Verse 21, they became futile in their thinking. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Come, uh, come, uh, 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 claiming to be wise, they became fools. Verse 26, for this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. He then speaks of sexual perversions. Mainly homosexuality and lesbianism are mentioned there. Verse 28, he goes on to say, Since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what they ought not to do. The LGBTQ community and those who support them have made a serious mistake. They have defined what is good and acceptable without proper external validation of the facts. They have not listened to what God says. They have not listened to what nature has said. They have not listened to the effects on home and family or a society. Purely on their own misdirected feelings and desires, they have become those who seek their own way rather than first having an affection for the Almighty. The world feels freedom comes from unleashing feelings about God. Just get rid of those things. Get those things out of the way, and then any kind of desire and lust can become acceptable. Like most blessings from God, our affection can be misplaced, and we can have feelings for something or someone which is not proper, God is saying. Therefore, we need God's direction for both our knowledge and our feelings. The kind of love that seeks its own is, the, is, the, is a love that is preoccupied with its own feelings on any given matter. It has become so prevalent that we might not even notice it, you and me. I know this person is married. I understand that, but I know she's off limits. God says not to covet another man's wife. God says not to look upon another woman this way with lustful intention, but, you know, it feels right. I feel like it's okay. In 1972, the originally released song featuring Luther Ingram says, if loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. You know how popular that song was? It was remade in 74 by Miley Jackson, remade again by Rod Stewart in 77, and remade most recently by Leanne Rimes in 06. This song, the speaker is asking the question, am I wrong to fall so deeply in love with you knowing that I got a wife and two children depending on me too? And am I wrong to hunger for the gentleness of your touch knowing I got somebody else 
at home who needs me just as much? I say to you, ladies and gentlemen, the answer to that question is, yes, you are wrong. And the reason that you are wrong is because you are only thinking of your own feelings. You are putting your love first. And it's a perverted love. I know God's word condemns homosexuality and lesbianism, but you know what? I have these feelings. The objects of affection may differ on a numerous way of looking at this. On, 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 on a great many of different kinds of examples. But the conclusion is always the same. The conclusion is this, ladies and gentlemen. I matter, only I matter, and I will seek what matters to me. Elders can bully God's sheep and satisfy their own feelings on matters and they pervert God's church and they pervert what God says causes love among the brethren. Likewise, preachers can fill, be filled with destructive feelings of self-gratifying pride motivated by the prospect of having people love them more than anyone else and they will be the great leaders of God's people they are the sounding brass. They are the clanging cymbal. Because love is not what is motivating them, but rather selfish ambition motivates them. The teacher can love to keep brethren stirred up by introducing the latest brotherhood issue, perhaps thinking that by doing so, oh, they are so much more intelligent and well-versed than the average church member. They seek their own, you see? They're seeking after their own way. Love which seeks its own will inherently be preoccupied with how one feels and having one's own way while not considering how their actions may have great ripple effects in the life of God's people and their family and others around them. Love which seeks its own is the mantra of our day, and it affects us much more than what we might want to admit. Look there in your text again. I don't have it up here on the chart for you, but you can see it for yourself from your own text. The different viewpoint, for, for just a second, goes this way. Love which seeks its own, and just turn some of this around so that you can see it better. Love which seeks its own will envy. Love which seeks its own will parade itself. It will be painfully puffed up. Love which seeks its own will behave rudely. Love which seeks its own will easily be provoked. Love which seeks its own will be a love that seeks evil. It will rejoice in iniquity. It will reject the truth and it will not bear the responsibilities that real feelings of love for others demands of us. A love which seeks its own will be primarily concerned with how self feels. But biblical love, it does not demand its own rights. It first considers the feelings and the needs of others. One does not feel their way to true love, ladies and gentlemen. We submit our way there. So what is the answer to all of this? What is the answer? How do we reverse this mess that man has created, this redefinition of love? I tell you, it is the same way of those of the past. We do it one soul at a time by getting busy and fearlessly teaching about it, by not being caught off guard. I just want to, to, to encourage those who are preachers and teachers among us today. Don't be afraid. Do not be afraid of this topic. Our children are being ravished by this. And we must stand and speak and teach what God has said on the matter of love and sexuality. Too many for too long have been afraid to speak about these things because as is true, these things are embarrassing to be spoken about. Shuddering from embarrassment, ladies and gentlemen, is a whole lot better than shutting down conversation on the matter and watching our children drift away from our God. It may be that too many preachers and teachers are teaching a checklist of proper commands from God. But if there's one thing we know about Christian living and faithfulness, commands mean nothing without a heart that first loves God and promotes His love to others. 
The only way to keep ourselves pure is to be intentional in our efforts. We must be intentional in the way that we teach on these things. Take a great look at Deuteronomy chapter 6 and notice what God says there about how to go about teaching our youth and one another and ourselves. We start in our own heart and we move to our children's hearts and mom and dads, let's help our children to see the godless perversion of gratifying our feelings and our own happiness and blessings and rather look upon what God has blessed us with. Putting ourselves at the center of the universe is not God's way. But putting others there and putting Him there, that's the way. That's what brings true love. That's what brings true happiness. And that is what makes our feelings the way that they should be. Additionally, we must understand it's not enough for God's love to stay with us inside our homes and in our churches. It needs to go out in order to be effective. Who can change the world and our sinful feelings? Brothers and sisters, we know we're living proof. Our God can do that. One heart at a time, just like he did for you and me. He can do for others as well. Loving God's way, it never fails. And Jesus is that prime example. The proof of what it means to not seek our own. He stepped down there from heaven. He lowered himself for the needs of others. He stretched out his arms and he died in a place that we could not fulfill. Not for himself, but for us. He was looking out for the interests of us. He is the ultimate example of the opposite of a love which seeks its own. And I say to you, ladies and gentlemen, if you find that attractive in our God, don't you know, he will forever find that attractive in you and me. Thank you for listening this morning.